My name is Bill Beither. I am the co-founder and CEO of Machine Metrics. And uh, what we are is a, an IoT and analytics platform for discrete manufacturers. And today I'll be talking about how we really drive decisions with machine data. So this is a, a photo of uh, one of our customers um, before they installed Machine Metrics. It's a precision CNC manufacturing company or machine shop. Uh, they make aerospace components. And um, what you'll see here is there's uh, equipment, these CNC machines, that uh, each one, this shop has uh, about 40, uh, each one costs a few hundred thousand dollars. And uh, they're quite advanced. There's a lot of data that these machines produce. However, this data is not being captured in any way to really drive decisions and uh, drive efficiency on the shop floor. And uh, one of, the, uh, one of the, the common themes that we hear across uh, this industry, and this is really kind of where we've, uh, we, we focused, our, our beachhead, let's call it, is that at the end of the day, when um, uh, one example was uh, a job was supposed to produce 100 parts a day, at the end of the day, um, it was common to see 75 parts, 80 parts, maybe 90 parts. And uh, when the owner looked back to find out, um, well, why are they not meeting their rate, it was really difficult. Um, There's a lot of finger pointing. You know, the operators would, you know, would come up with excuses, and there really wasn't that data to understand why production wasn't being met. And another uh, another example, um, a different uh, a different facility. I walked through, and uh, their um, very specialized shop. They were running lathes. These uh, these lathes lathes are uh, they're turning metal, and each of these machines had a bar, this long bar that that fed into the machine. And I noticed that those bar feeders, the doors were open, which is really strange. So I asked the, um, um, the, the production manager there, you know, why are you running with, a, with the doors open? And uh, he said that, well, I'm listening for the sound that, that this makes. You know, when the bars are slightly bent, um, it starts making this unique sound. It, the vibration increases, and, and then it, it causes the, the bar to jam, and all the tooling inside the machine actually um, essentially explodes. They, they all break and it cause, causes uh, over $1,000 of damage every time, um, a few hours of downtime. This happens multiple times a week. So these are just a couple examples. There's many, many other examples of, um, of the situations that occur on the shop floor that causes uh, machine downtime. Um, the, uh, the average downtime that, that we see across the industry of our customers or the, is, uh, is about 70%. So only 30% of the time do these machines actually run and produce. So there's a lot of opportunity here for improvement. So um, this is a, uh, a study that was performed by AGC, and it really identifies that there's, uh, that there's these like, multi-billion dollar software companies, multi-billion dollar industrial companies, and they're both trying to bridge the gap. It's a huge gap, multi-trillion dollars, and um, it's yet to be filled. About 74% of IoT or industrial IoT projects fail, and really they're they're failing because well one, the uh, there's a, it's very complex to connect to the equipment on these uh, factory floors. Um, two, there's a lack of sort of domain knowledge, and most of the platforms that exist today um, really have very little out of the box functionality. There's a lot of customization that's required for these projects to be successful. Uh, so this is really uh, what we're looking to solve. So if you look at um, you know, manufacturing today, um, you really have um, you know, just this uh, sort of single flow, one directional flow during the manufacturing life cycle. So you, essentially, you have, uh, you're designing the product, uh, you then, um, you're then you know, buying all your materials, you're processing your orders, you're manufacturing that product, product goes out to the field and requires service, and um, it's very difficult to receive feedback to iterate and improve the design, the, the logistics, the, uh, the production, and the, and the maintenance. So with that data, you're able to you know, close that loop and greatly improve um, all aspects of your manufacturing life cycle. So this is um, you know, really what a uh, sort of a, a standard um, IoT platform looks like. Um, at a basic level, you have an edge device. That edge device connects to the asset on the shop floor. Um, Usually it's, it's pulling data from sensors that are already on that asset or, or new sensors can be installed. Um, that, uh, that device then sends time series data to the data lake or data warehouse, generally in the cloud. That, data is, that time series data is then analyzed in real time so that uh, triggers can, uh, can be sent, notifications, alerts to 
essentially the right person at the right time to take action. And these triggers can initiate external systems, um, for example, like a visual workflow system or a maintenance system, um, and, uh, and, and or the, the, the data itself is uh, stored indefinitely. You can tie that into like a BI platform uh, to perform, sort of, you know, have dashboards, you, you basically present uh, historical data. Um, and the more advanced systems would actually connect to other factory systems, like an ERP, or um, you might add human context to that, to that data. So what, um, what I'm showing you here is how we've really tackled this problem. This is uh, one of our recent installations. And uh, this is where we, you know, we're a little bit of a hardware company, more of a software company. Um, you can see our edge device, that green box over here that's attached to the machine. This, this, uh, this edge device is powered by the machine. Um, it, uh, it communicates to the cloud via wireless. So you can see the wires going outside the machine. And then it's pulling information from uh, a couple of relays. So you can see up here we have our digital acquisition device, a couple of relays. Um, this, in, this indicates, um, uh, I'm not sure what happened here, but um, th those relays indicate that you know, if the machine is, is running or not, also uh, when it completes the cycle. And, uh, and the, uh, the, other, the other ways that we can commonly connect to these machines would be through analog sensors, like accelerometers or current sensors. Uh, if the machine is newer, there's a lot more information you can collect from the control itself. These modern machines might have hundreds or, you know, or even thousands of data items that we're able to, to collect in real time. Um, often we'll actually tie in external sensors with the machine control data uh, to really add a lot of context to that, uh, to that uh, machining process. So I, I don't want to uh, understate how challenging it is to build a, an edge connectivity system that is easy enough to install that maintenance technicians can install this themselves. Um, that's been, you know, a lot of our work has been making this really, really simple for our customers. So um, what I like to, I like to talk about um, our analytics journey. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard. I mean, we're collecting data, we're, we, now, we now have data in a data lake, but the, the real value comes in how that data is actually being used to drive value. So you want to understand, like, what's happening now? Um, you know, why is it happening? And then, you know, what's likely to happen in the future? And then it's kind of the holy grail is, uh, what am I going to do about it? So I'm going to go through a few use cases of how we're achieving this uh, analytics journey for our customers. So that same shop that I, that I showed a couple slides back, this is what this shop looked like after Machine Metrics. And you can see there's um, these uh, big screen TVs with, uh, with the dashboard that shows you the status of the machine. Also. The, um, the, the performance of that machine compared to the, you know, the goals that, uh, that have been set. And above that operator is, a, is an interface, an operator interface that allows humans to add context to that, uh, to that machine data. And uh, what, uh, what we found after we installed machine metrics is that um, the case where you know, we're only producing 80 out of the 100 parts, um, the, um, the data showed that as soon as the operators actually showed up at 6 a.m., um, they were grabbing a cup of coffee, cleaning their work area, they would chat with their colleagues. They really didn't have that accountability to start the machines right away. Very simple. But once we put these dashboards up, that behavior changed overnight. Um, and, um, and we see this uh, across the board. There's, there's uh, so many use cases where having that data visibility can provide improvements, you know, efficiency, efficiency gains of 10 or 20 percent or even more. So that's, uh, that's one example. Um, once we find out what's happening on that, on that shop floor, we can really dive deep through diagnostic analytics. This is really answering the question why. Um, this is a timeline that you can go back in time you know, during, say, a machine crash. Like, well, what happened? What happened leading up to it? What was the temperature? What, you know, was the vibration level too high? You know, what was the alarm that the machine triggered? So this information is really useful for really you know, understanding root cause of, um, of your problems. And then, um, so there's a lot of talk about predictive analytics. And um, so we've been really helping our customers you know, understand you know, when their machines are going to fail or um, when they might not be able to deliver that their, their products on time uh, to their customer. Um, here's an example. Um, so the example that I mentioned with the, um, um, those lays that had the bent bars and they had to listen you know, to hear the, the vibration before they go and stop the machine uh, before it caused damage. Uh, well, all we did is we installed an accelerometer um, on that machine, on that bar feeder, and, uh, and essentially um, 
set up a, a trigger. So when, they, when the, uh, and it's very simple, this is not a rocket science, right? We just uh, set a threshold and when we exceed that threshold, we let them know through an alert that you need to stop your machine before it explodes, right? So here's an example of um, you know, an, an alert that, that's sent also in our user interface, vibration exceeded. And um, you know, this is a real example of what that looked like. So you can see you know, where, where it triggered and basically the customer received the alert and problem avoided. So, you know, not a very difficult problem, but each one of these predictive analytics problems is fairly unique. So the challenge actually is putting this into the hands of the customer so they can configure their alerts and their analytics to, to meet their needs. And we spend a lot of time making that very easy. So the, um, you know, it's kind of the holy grail in analytics is prescriptive analytics. Um, essentially, you want to, not only do you want to know what's about to happen, um, and um, you know, there's a lot of fancy UI or um, AI that allows you to do that. Um, you know, we have uh, unsupervised machine learning algorithms that run in the, um, in the background to detect anomalies, for example. Um, well, if you attach that with instructions on the, on the actual alert, you can then inform the machine operator, the maintenance technician, or whoever is really required to take action. You can tell them what they need to do to prevent that problem from happening or um, from actually you know, resolve that problem that's happening right now. And you know, all we do is uh, we tie into that alert. This is an example of a predicted maintenance message that is going to fire um, when maintenance is due in the machine. We include instructions. This is what you need to do to solve that problem. Um, again, it's not rocket science, but you know, it's very useful if you have this tribal knowledge on the shop floor, you know, a workforce that's retiring. You document that information, you put it into an instruction, and you show it at the right time uh, you can have um, you know, lesser skilled or um, newer operators that can perform this maintenance that traditionally only more experienced uh, operators could perform. So, you know, a real basic, um, um, you know, all these use cases are, you know, actually relatively simple. Um, this is where the value is, you know, especially in an in industry where this technology is not prevalent. Um, but what we're able to do because we're capturing all this data is we have a data science team that can really apply advanced analytics on the data. And, and surface it in ways that uh, we hadn't really thought of, thought of before. So, you know, here's an example of, um, you know, on the right here, uh, we actually installed these, uh, you know, these current sensors right on the, the, the spindle that actually is, you know, is operating the cutting tool. And because we have the information of what tool is in place at any given time, you might have 20 tools for one part, uh, we, can, uh, we can segment that out and look at the load over time, there are the power required, so you can actually track the wear of that tool. And uh, what we're able to do is actually uh, is increase the amount of time that these tools are actually cutting before they need to be replaced. Because you know, shops like this are very conservative. They generally throw away tooling when it still has 50% life left. Well, if you have a system like this, we can notify them when you know, there might be an outlier tool that's going to fail earlier. We can let them know so that they have more confidence that they can run those tools closer to the end of life. And this is one of the biggest expenses that that you know, our customers have on the shop floor. And uh, another example, one of the advantages of having access to all this data is that uh, you can imagine that, that our data actually represents a slice of the industry. So we can you know, unsurface these insights that goes across customers, you know, across different machines and different industries, and we can let our customers know how they're performing. We can benchmark them against their, you know, their peers that are in, you know, in their segment of the market. And uh, you know, for example, we can, um, you know, you might see that your machine utilization is 41 and a half percent. You know, that's maybe that's not so great. Well, they're actually in the in the 78th percentile. You know, not so bad. But you can imagine that there's many decisions that you can make if you understand, you know, how your shop is performing compared to others, you know, in your in your segment of the industry. So um, this is just, um, you know, all of these examples are. Um, you know, there's many other use cases, and, and the great thing about an IoT platform analytics is that, um, that you can surface this information in, in various ways. But the, what I want to point out in this analytics journey is that most of the value is right at the bottom here. So what is happening? Descriptive analytics. Most factories don't even have the basics in place. So that's where, um, you know, while we're pushing the envelope up in the predictive, prescriptive analytics, um, this is where we start. And uh, it, could, it typically takes a lot of time to bring a customer up into the predictive and prescriptive analytics. There's certain use cases where you can get there faster, but you know, our, you know, our lesson learned is, you know, I, I used to describe us as a predictive analytics 
uh, uh, platform for manufacturers. You know, really, it's um, descriptive analytics is 90% of the value that we that we provide our customers. And uh, with that, I'll um, I think I've hit the, my mark. I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you. So, first question. I'll I'll, I'll take the first one, okay. since I have the mic. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, beyond prescriptive analytics, is there a world where um, you get to full automation, where the, you know, the analytics lead yeah. to an action and the machine sort of self-learns and self-corrects? Yes, and I call that adaptive manufacturing, and it's kind of the BHAG that, that we have. So, you know, really to enable you know, what you know, the ability to... Um, self-optimize without a human um, does require, you know, the predictive and prescriptive analytics and one additional step, which is the control of the equipment. And um, we've, um, it, this is an area that requires a lot of confidence, um, a lot of security. Um, it's one that we've purposely held back on for now, um, but it's not to say that we haven't had requests. I mean, the example of the, um, that, the uh, bar feeder that was vibrating, it's only one signal on our, on our edge device, I could turn that machine off. We haven't done that yet. But, uh, but it's definitely and, you know, something that we're thinking about. And that's kind of the start of this adaptive manufacturing, which is really, you know, I see as the future. Yep. Hi. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. I really liked your comment about the workers just having coffee while they're waiting for things to happen. So along those lines, a couple of questions. One is, is your framework really meant for the American manufacturing frame, you know, the, the plant where there are human beings who are doing this stuff and it's not clear to them what their metric is. Like if they say, okay, go and, you know, mill like 20 parts of this today, they'll go and do it, right? Whereas here it seems like the analysis of the whole system is not clear, whether the workers are compensated for how many parts they turn out per day, what's the quality of their work mm -hmm. and so on. So any comments about that? Thank you. Yeah, so um, you know, a couple comments to that. One is uh, our highest performing customer compensates their operators based on performance. And the only way for them to do that is to actually have this data. And, um, and the other thing, you know, we're, we're continuously trying to improve efficiency on the factory floor. And, uh, you know, one of the drivers here is that it's really hard to find skilled manufacturing workers to replace the retiring workforce. Um, it's actually the biggest problem that this industry actually has is recruiting. So you know, you're forced to really make sure, to be competitive, you have to you know, run more pieces of equipment with fewer people. And uh, you know, not to mention the global competition that um, you know, American manufacturers have. Um, you know, we're global, but uh, a lot of our business you know, starting in, in this country is here. So, uh, so we're seeing a lot of value there. Right, thanks for sharing. My question is, you said adoption's relatively low across manufacturing. Which kind of subsectors have you seen are more likely to actually say, I want this kind of technology? So, um, I, I'm sorry, so you asked, you asked the question of well, what s sectors of manufacturing we yeah. most, would most um, want to use this technology. Um, so there's actually, so, so we really st started in sort of the, the middle market, let's say, and there's, um, I think, I would say the middle market is definitely right down here in, you know, not having almost no visibility on the shop floor. But as the company has matured, we're actually working more and more with uh, very large manufacturers. And, uh, and that's where some of the data science capabilities, some of these advanced analytics becomes more, um, you know, more valuable. And um, so it really kind of, it, it ranges the gamut. Um, we spend more time in, in descriptive analytics on the, the smaller, let's say, you know, under a billion dollar company. And then sort of the over billion dollar company, we're spending a little bit more time up in the predictive because they already have systems that, that, will, you know, that will surface data, you know, their BI platforms that are tied into the, into the data. So that answers your question. Yeah. Sure. Thank you for the presentation, very interesting. Um, it's a very busy space with a lot of competition. How do you see your competitive advantage from the big companies uh, trying to squeeze in from uh, small companies, only software, only hardware. How do you see your business defensibility there? Yeah, a couple of ways. I mean, one is in the data. So, you know, it's really challenging to, to be able to have, you know, access to the data where we can then continuously develop new algorithms. 
Um, you know, a lot of the companies out there, you know, it's, it's more about the, you know, the edge connectivity or horizontal platforms. Um, the other competitive advantage we have is, is we've really um, very deeply vertically integrated into you know, discrete manufacturing, but, um, but our beachhead really is in you know, CNC metal manufacturing. We're expanding into, into other uh, verticals as well. So you know, those, and then and I guess the third really is just the simplicity. You know, the, the vertical integration really gives us the out of the box capabilities, but then putting this into the hand, hands of the customers, you don't have to write custom code, is uh, really allows us to, to, you know, to show that value very, very fast. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.